so what exactly are you doing? <laughs> so yeah, like we have to pull to get the oil cooler out. We have to pull the turbo out. And uh, because the way this whole bullshit arranged is there's an uh, intake that comes up and kind of crosses over and it blocks you from being able to access the oil cooler to pull it out. So you've got to pull the turbos out and get them out of the way. You got to pull the turbo pedestal out, get it up and out of the way. Then you can remove the oil cooler so you can kind of wedge it backwards and up and out to clear the intake pipe that's crossing over. That's dumb. Yes. <laughs> hey there. You need to replace the oil cooler in your 6.4 liter power joke, but don't have either the money or desire to pay someone else four figures to do it, and you also don't have much love for your knuckles or respect for your time? Then follow along with me as I'll show you step by step how to replace your oil cooler while leaving the cab on in this episode of I Hate Working on Cars! <laughs> watch and review this whole video from start to finish before you decide to tackle this project yourself. I spent four days doing this job, and that's not counting the cooling system flush, which you should set aside a whole day for as well. Now that I've done the job once, I could probably do it again in half the time, but it's getting past a few steps that are a huge pain in the ass for first timers is what soaked up so much of my time. If you have the normal 6.4 oil cooler failure, which is the PO12F DTC code, caused by clogged coolant passages, which therefore causes your engine oil temps to climb above spec and can in some cases be bad enough to throw you into low power mode, and this procedure is for you. If you instead have a ruptured cooler giving you a coolant milkshake, you'll need to add a step of flushing your system with Simple Green and then performing the factory cooling system flush, but doing all of that after changing the oil cooler. Since it doesn't make much sense to try and clean and flush out your system with a failed oil cooler just refilling it the entire time with oil, it sucks because you could conceivably reclog your brand new oil cooler with the flush and then have to change the damn thing twice, which is something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But here we are, just dealing with the reality that is what Ford and International have done to us. F*** you, Ford Turd National. One point of order before we dive in is tools. The process doesn't actually include a ton of steps, but some of the individual steps are complete nightmares. The big hurdles on this job are, number one, accessing the exhaust up-pipe bolts that attach to the rear of the turbo. Number two, actually wiggle-jiggering the oil cooler itself out and back in again while the intake manifold is still installed. Number three, accessing the 10 millimeter bolts that hold the oil cooler in place just below the forward portion of the intake manifold. Here's how I dealt with issue number one. I purchased a handful of what I would consider disposable tools ahead of time. And the couple tools I used that really made the difference for me was this 10 millimeter rationing six point wrench, which I abused and eventually broke, so get a couple of them. I'll leave an iShilliant link in the video description below. Also, this mini ratchet in a fresh 10 millimeter six point socket to help you wind the bolts out and back in again. Dealing with issue number two was something I cheated a little bit with. I was able to get the oil cooler out, but getting the new one back in required me doing a bit of grind into the oil cooler assembly. You may or may not be so lucky, so it's a good idea to have intake gaskets ready, which are pretty inexpensive anyway, and just in case you decide to pull the intake manifold. If you do, there's an extra heat shield you'll have to remove, and you'll want to replace those heat shield bolts with fresh ones. Issue number three is easily handled with a simple quarter inch drive 10 millimeter six point swivel socket, which I'll also leave a link to in the video description below. Other than that, you should have a good assortment of tools like lots of different extensions, deep and shallow six point sockets, an electric ratchet, a torque wrench that does inch pounds, a cherry picker or an extra friend to help you lift the turbo out and so on. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? If you're trying to do this with the 99 piece Craftsman tool set your daddy gave you, well, good f***ing luck. Now let's talk parts. Obviously, you'll need a replacement oil cooler, and I'll leave a link to the video description below for the Mishimoto cooler with the lifetime warranty that I used. And you can also check out the video I did where I cut in half and compared the Mishimoto to the factory cooler side by side. Besides that, you're also going to need a turbo pedestal gasket, a turbo service kit, gaskets for the EGR downpipe with new bolts, your little oil filter stand pipe o-ring, the exhaust down pipe gasket that meets up with the turbo. I recommend also having on hand intake manifold gaskets just in case. If you don't use them, you can always return them later, but it's cheap insurance to have them around. 
Also have on hand the coolant, the cooling system cleaner, and if you have the milkshake issue, Simple Green. I'll leave some more links to other videos for the Simple Green flush and my own for the factory Ford cooling system flush procedure. All right, let's get into this step by step. We already covered some of this before, but step one is to flush the cooling system if you don't have a ruptured oil cooler. If you do, you'll skip and do that step after we have the new oil cooler installed. Check the info tab for my Ford factory cooling system flush video and check the video description for the Simple Green flush procedure if you need it. Step two, disconnect and yank out your two batteries. All you need is an eight millimeter socket and a strong back. Step three, yank out the air cleaner assembly by disconnecting the two electrical connectors and loosening up the eight millimeter band clamp, then you can yank it out. You know how to yank hard on stuff, don't you? Step four is gonna be to remove the intake elbow. There's this stupid clamp black thing here. I'll just destroy it, replace it with a hose clamp later. Then I'll loosen up the eight millimeter band clamp and tug on my elbow. Just to be safe, I'll use some hull masking tape to protect the turbo from FOD. Step five, you'll remove the degas bottle. Start by pulling the 13 millimeter bolt to hold her in. Remove the little return hose at the top. Use a pick tool and pull the clip on the hose at the bottom and remove the lower hose. Do the same thing with the upper radiator hose and make some room. Then wrangle the degas bottle out, taking care to remove the small vacuum line as you go and disconnect the vacuum line from the tank. Step six, remove the fuel cooler. Let's start by removing the long upper hose first and tuck that out of the way. Then remove the short end of the hose and plug it into the top of the fuel cooler to keep coolant from leaking out all over the place. Now, disconnect the two 17 millimeter fuel line banjo bolts. Pay attention to the two gaskets here. The turbo service kit has replacements. Just note where they go. The sun, now, there are some 10 and 13 millimeter bolts to remove on the fuel cooler bracket. I ended up removing more of the bracket than was necessary. You don't have to remove the lower part of the bracket, just the upper will do. Now let's carefully disconnect any wire harness clips and disconnect the wire harness that connects to the turbo variable vane actuator. While you're there, disconnect the last cooling line to the turbo assembly and get that out of the way. Now you ought to be able to argue the fuel cooler out of the truck. Once again, I'll tape up the turbo to prevent potentially fodding it. And I can also wriggle out this little extension bit. It's not bolted in or anything, it just sits there. Step seven, disconnect the upper charge pipe with an 11 millimeter ratchet or ratcheting wrench. If you're having some trouble getting the charge pipe loose, you can use a pick tool to wriggle in between the pipe and the inlet to break the seal. Again, I'll tape off the turbo hole for my own amusement. Step eight, remove the two 17 millimeter banjo bolts for the oil supply lines to the turbos. Once again, be aware of the two little gaskets for each line, and also there are replacements in the turbo service kit. Now I'll remove the eight millimeter bolt that secures the oil supply line and then get real creative about how I pull the damn thing out because it's really wedged in there something tight. That's some serious kit. <laughs> well, it's for bending out like serious metal. <laughs> Did it work? Oh. I have to use that on the hood. <laughs> hey! <laughs> you got it! It's a good idea to find a plug now to plug the dirty brown hole you just opened up so you don't get nothing you don't want entering your dirty brown hole. Step nine, remove the five eight millimeter bolts that secure the turbo heat shield, then remove the shield. Be careful with these if you encounter stiff resistance as you're removing the screw. Stop, shoot it with some liquid wrench, screw it back in, then screw it back out so you don't go twisting the bolt in half. Step 10, bust the exhaust downpipe loose. Start at the top with the 11 millimeter band clamp. Take the screw all the way off and you'll be able to remove the T-bolt and then hammer the band clamp loose.
Now I'll crawl under the truck and remove the two bolts to free the downpipe. This will make it nice and loose so it's completely out of your way. Got it. <laughs> Step 11, remove the front fuel supply line with a 17 millimeter socket. We disconnected the other half of this earlier when we did the fuel cooler. Now we're just getting the rest of the line out of the way. Step 12, there are two 10 millimeter bolts that support the EGR pipe to a bracket attached to one of the turbo up pipes. Use a new or name brand 6 point 10 millimeter socket. A 3 8 drive short socket fits perfectly well in here with a swivel head ratchet wrench. Step 13. Now unbolt the EGR pipe at the top. Here I can fit a half inch drive ratchet wrench to remove the two 10 millimeter bolts. To access the rearmost bolt, I found a half inch to 3 8 adapter, plus a 3 8 drive deep well 10 millimeter socket was just the right amount of length to get at the bolt. Once it's broken loose, this is where an electric ratchet comes in super handy. To further take stress off the pipe and make it more mobile back there to give you more room to work, I'll remove the 10 millimeter bolt that holds the middle of the pipe to the block and also remove the two EGR bolts so the whole EGR pipe is just floating loosely back there. Step 14, it's time to tackle the real nightmare of this whole job and that's the six up pipe bolts. So take a breather, smoke a fruit roll up and relax. It's going to take a while. This is where that 10 millimeter six point ratcheting wrench comes into play that I talked about at the beginning of the video. If you can slip that on the bottom bolts and then use another wrench like a three quarter inch box wrench like I used, you can get enough leverage to fairly easily break the bolt loose. Once it's broke loose, you can use the tiny ratchet back there to finish getting it out. The top two bolts and the outermost bolts are pretty straightforward once you get the bottom nightmare bolts figured out. But nonetheless, much of what we're doing back here is one ratchet click at a time. It's going to take a while, so be patient. I recommend working on the driver's side up pipe first and removing all three of those bolts. The bottom bolt can best be accessed by going underneath the pipe, and once loose, you can one-click your way to freedom. The passenger side up pipe can be accessed from the bottom or from the top, but not from the passenger side. The high-pressure fuel pump heat shield blocks access to that particular bolt with a ratchet. Step 15. Remove the two 15 millimeter turbo to pedestal bolts. That's all that's left holding the turbo in place. Step 16. Remove the turbo. Now there's a special bracket. Hell, there's a whole special service kit you can find used on eBay for like $1,200. So fuck that shit. I just found some metric bolts lying around. They came out of a Ford Explorer exhaust manifold. I think they're M8s. And I stuck them through some chain with some washers for free. If you want, you can just yank this out by hand. Easier if you got two people, but this just seemed like the lowest effort way to please my lazy bone. I'll alternate between applying some pull and wedging the turbos loose with the pry bar. You can see the two turbos are loose. This means the mating gaskets are pretty much shot, but that's okay because the turbo service kit comes with new ones. Step 17. Remove the 10 millimeter nut that secures the high pressure turbo drain pipe and remove the drain pipe. Step 18. Vacuum out the engine valley to prevent debris from falling through the engine and into the crankcase once we start removing the turbo pedestal and oil cooler. Step 19. Remove the two 10 millimeter and four 13 millimeter bolts that secure the turbo pedestal to the block and remove the turbo pedestal. Bust out the vacuum one more time, clean up the area, and tape it off to keep debris out of the valley. Step 20. Remove the electrical connectors for the oil pressure and temperature sensors on the oil cooler. Yeah. Press that down and yeah. pull it out. 
I'll come out. Okay. Pull that up. This yellow guy, pull that up, and then unlocks this clip, which you push in. So, put your thumb or with the thigh used a tool, and it'll come out. I didn't do this, but I recommend removing the sensors at this time. It'll give you a bit more room to work with. If you choose to remove the sensors, plug the dirty brown holes with some dirty brown hole plugs. I also used a zip tie to hold the connectors away from my work area. Step 21, there's a 10 millimeter bolter or two, a wire retainer clip, and the fuel temperature sensor plug you can remove to free up the wiring harness that runs just in front of your face to give yourself more room to see and work. There we go. Now I have lots of room to work with. Pull those out and move the harness out of your way. Quick note, what you see next is going to appear a bit out of order, but don't worry about it because hindsight is 2020, or so I've heard, and I've moved the steps around in the video so they make the job easier than what I did to myself. Step 22, remove the 10 millimeter stud bolt and the two 8 millimeter bolts that secure the fuel filter housing in place. Yeah, you gotta use the, you gotta remove the wiring harness to access this bolt which is under, it's kind of, it's, this wiring harness actually sits on top of this stud. We don't need to remove the fuel filter. We just want it loose so we can move it a bit out of our way. Now grab a 10 millimeter socket and remove the two bolts to secure the fuel line to the top of the intake manifold. Step 23, remove the oil filter cap with a 36 millimeter socket or a large adjustable wrench and pull out the oil filter. Then, with a T45 Torx bit, remove the four Torx bolts that secure the oil filter housing to the oil cooler. While you're in there, grab some long pliers and wriggle out the wiring harness that's sitting atop a stud that holds down the front of the oil cooler. Then, with a T27 Torx bit, remove the bolt that retains the oil filter standpipe, turn the oil pipe counterclockwise, then up to remove it. Now, at the front of the cooler, there's a diagnostic port plug I need to take out and help with clearance. It's maybe an 18 millimeter? I can't remember, but whatever it is, go at it with a wrench and pull it out. Step 24, you should now have an oil cooler that's free of the oil filter housing and standpipe, the front diagnostic plug, oil tip, and pressure sensors. It should look more naked than Paris Hilton in a dark cell phone porno. Now it's time to get this oil cooler loose and out. I'm gonna start with a 10 millimeter deep well six point socket to remove that stud bolt that the wiring harness was sitting on top of. Then I'll switch over to the 10 millimeter six point swivel socket I told you to buy at the beginning of the video, and I'll be able to access the bolts in the corners with that. Once you have the three bolts at the front out, the rest of the oil cooler bolts are pretty easy to access. Now we can wiggle jigger the oil cooler assembly out. So it's kind of, just gotta wiggle it. You gotta jiggle it and wiggle it and rock it. This has to be loose enough because it's gotta be able to come up. We're out. And that down there is the oil cooler. Once you complete the hostage negotiations and get it out of there, vacuum up the area and cover it up with tape or a towel. Step 25, remove the top bit of the oil cooler assembly by removing the several T30 Torx bolts. Step 26, there is a 13 millimeter nut under here. Find it and remove it. Then flip the assembly over and remove the remaining four 13 millimeter bolts that secure the oil cooler. You might need to break it loose by prying on it a tiny bit. Step 27, with a pick tool or a tiny screwdriver, pluck all the gasket snow rings out of the oil cooler assembly, filter housing, and turbo pedestal gasket. I'm fortunate enough to have a nice parts washer, but you can do the same thing with a can or three of parts cleaner. Make certain you thoroughly blow out the parts before we put things together. We don't want any solvents in our oil or coolant passages. Step 28, 
Install your new turbo pedestal gasket. Step 29. Install all new gaskets and O-rings in the oil cooler assembly. The rest of the assembly is serviced in my case by the gaskets that came with the Mishimoto oil cooler. With all the new gaskets and O-rings installed, we can install the new oil cooler. Since the Motocraft cooler comes in as an assembly, I wasn't able to find torque specs, so I torqued the 13mm bolts down to 23 foot-pounds and I'll hope for the best. Don't forget the low nut on the top. Step 30. Install the filter base to the oil cooler housing by reinstalling all T30 torque bolts and torquing them down to 89 inch-pounds. Step 31. Let's service the turbo now. I'll start by removing the chain I used to lift the turbos out of the truck. I need to do this because right now this is the only thing holding the two turbos together and I need to split them apart. Once I break my turbos in half, I'll replace the little oil drain nurple. It's directional, so make sure you install it correctly. I'll pull the old one out with some noodle nose pliers, and then I'll use a socket and a rubber mallet to gently tap in the new nurple. Step 32. There are two gaskets in between the turbos, and they're both included in the turbo service kit. I'll yeet the old gaskets, brush off the soot from the mating surfaces, and I'll install the new gaskets. Since I lack the aforementioned $1,200 tool to assemble these, I'm going to improvise. I'll stand the high pressure turbo on end, then I'll lower the low pressure turbo onto it. The reason why there's a special tool for this is the mating gasket is a tight fit and you want to get it on straight or you'll damage it on installation. So here's how I worked it. I started with some careful tapping with a rubber mallet to get it started. Then I found a couple bolts to use and screwed those in place. Now, I'll alternate tightening the screws just a little and tapping around the turbo with a hammer on the other side to drive the two turbos together. I'm going to use a micrometer to make sure I'm maintaining a squarish gap on all sides as I work. It's a little bit tedious, but with some patience, the install method worked just fine for me. Step 33. Install the new exhaust outlet downpipe gasket. You can remove the old one by just bending the tabs that hold it in place. Take inspiration from that when you install the replacement. And that's all we have to do to the turbo. We can now throw the chain back on if that's what you're using. Step 34. The turbo service kit includes three color-coded O-rings. They're for the oil supply line we removed and the oil return pipe that goes under the turbo, which we also removed. Use a pick or a small flathead screwdriver to remove each O-ring and replace with the new ones, using the color coding as your guide. Step 35. With all the parts serviced now, we can go ahead and get into the heated argument with the oil cooler until it decides it's ready to go to bed. Clearance with the intake manifold here is tight, and you may find yourself in the position I did, which is where the cooler was just like a half a millimeter from popping back in. I was able to make the cooler fit by doing some very minor grinding on the oil cooler housing assembly, just grinding away some casting overlap, nothing significant. I wouldn't want to make it thin anywhere. At some point, if I wasn't going to go in, I'd just pull the intake manifold. But I'd be lying if I didn't admit I spent hours trying to get this damn thing to go back in. Anywho, install all the 10mm oil cooler bolts and torque them down to 23 inch pounds. Step 36. Reinstall the turbo pedestal. All the 10 and 13mm bolts are torqued to 45 foot pounds. Step 37, reinstall the diagnostic port cover. It is, after all, an 18 millimeter. Step 38, install the fuel filter standpipe. Double check that you installed the gasket and standpipe notches in place, so you'll need to install it, then twist it clockwise until it stops, at which point you can torque the T25 torque bits down to 61 inch pounds. Step 39, install the oil filter housing, torque the T45 Torx bolts to 16 foot-pounds. Step 40, install the oil pressure and temperature sensors if you haven't already, and reconnect them. Make sure you re-secure the wiring harness onto the stud bolt at the front of the oil cooler assembly. Step 41, 
Secure the fuel filter housing, replace the 10 millimeter stud bolt and the two 8 millimeter bolts and torque them all to 114 inch pounds. Also, reinstall the two 10 millimeter nuts that secure the fuel lines to the top of the intake manifold. Step 42, secure the wiring harness by sliding it over the stud bolt, then reconnect the fuel temperature sensor. Now, reinstall the 10 millimeter retaining bolt for the wiring harness. Work your way around the remainder of the wiring harness and re-secure any plastic retainer clips you removed to free the harness. Step 43, reinstall the turbo drain pipe. Use a mallet and screwdriver to help drive in the fresh O-ring, which you should have coated with a small amount of oil. Secure the pipe by reinstalling the 10 millimeter nut. Ensure the drain pipe is properly seated over the intake manifold stud and moving freely. There should be a small amount of play to allow for thermal expansion and torque movements. Step 44, install the oil filter with a 36 millimeter socket and torque it down to 18 foot pounds. Step 45, grab your buddy or your engine hoist and install the turbo. Take care that you have your two dowel alignment pins installed and carefully lower the turbo into position. It's a tight, wiggle jiggerly fit, but pay attention to how I lower it in and you can do it with all the filters installed. I go in a little crooked and angled to wedge it in through the tight space, but it'll go. Just be patient and don't force anything. Once the pins and the oil drains are lined up, the turbo will just settle into place. There's no need to force it. It's settled right down now. Step 46, install the two turbo hold down bracket dealios. The rear one is a bit fiddly to get to, so just be patient and it'll fall into place. Gonna cut you just right, pull you up to out space. Alternate tightening them down, then torque the 15 millimeter bolts to 148 foot-pounds. Step 47, back to our turbo service kit bag, pull out the six new bolts and two gaskets for the nightmare up pipes, and take a deep breath before you crawl back on top of your power joke for some non-consensual sex as you screw her six ways from Sunday. Or maybe she screws you six ways from Sunday. Thankfully, it's easier getting them back in than it is taking them out. That's what she said. Though I'm not gonna pretend I used a torque wrench on the 10 millimeter bolts to get them down to 18 foot-pounds. It was more like three to four grunt noises. If you made it this far, you'll know how to get it back together, but don't forget to install the bracket for the EGR downpipe support and use a mirror, like a cut-up plastic shower shave mirror or a mirror on a stick to help you see back there. Step 48, reconnect the EGR downpipe. Start with the new gasket and the two bolts up behind the turbo and get those installed. If you can, torque those 10 millimeter bolts to 23 foot-pounds. After that, you can install the bolts for the EGR downpipe to support bracket I made sure you didn't forget about and torque those 10 millimeter bolts down to 23 foot-pounds as well. Since I'm reusing the old hardware, I'll throw a little blue Loctite on there for luck, but I wouldn't have been best to install fresh bolts. From there, you can crawl under the truck, install the 10 millimeter support bolt, and the two rear lower EGR cooler 13 millimeter bolts with its new gasket also to 23 foot pounds. Step 49, reconnect the exhaust downpipe, starting at the top with the 11 millimeter band clamp, and finishing at the bottom where your outlet meets up with the DPF. Step 50, we're getting so close now I can smell the diesel fuel. Or that's just coming from the fuel line I'm reinstalling now. This line has a little copper gasket instead of the pair of nylon looking uh, washer deals. So I'm going to reuse mine, but leave it loose for now. Step 51, go back into the turbo service kit bag and get out your turbo heat shield bolts. 
Also, if you have soot buildup from the turbo interface gasket leaking, now's a good time to brush that off. Now, let's install the heat shield, loosely install the bolts to help with the alignment, then torque the 8mm bolts down to 96 inch pounds. Step 52, install the oil supply line for the turbos. Use a little oil around the O-ring and you may still need to give it a love and tap to go in. Now, go back to the turbo kit bag and get you four of them black nylon gasket washer O-rings and use them on the oil supply lines where the banjo bolts go. Remember how they go on, one gasket on either side of the fitting. My version of the easy way is to throw one gasket on the banjo bolt, slide the bolt through the fitting, and slip the second gasket on from below onto the banjo bolt and screw her in. Do the same thing for both fittings. You can now torque down the 17mm banjo bolt to 28 foot-pounds. After that, we can install the torque down the 8mm bolt and secure the other end of this contraption to 114 inch-pounds. Step 53, let's untape some more of the turbo here and I'll install the turbo tube extension deal which just slides in and sits there for now. Step 54, now I'll reinstall the intake charge pipe by tightening down the 11mm clamp. But first, I need to finagle it a bit with this clip tool to try to get this piece of clamp here that provides even pressure around the whole pipe in the right place. Step 55, install the fuel cooler. You may have a little bit of a domestic dispute with it, but it's not too bad if you don't do what I did and remove the entire lower bracket. If you did, take it apart and install the lower bracket separately now. With that done, the fuel cooler assembly slides in place with just a minor argument. Now, grab all the 10 and 13 millimeter nuts and pan tighten them in place. There's also a small line back here we need to reconnect. I didn't get a good video shot of it, but it's coming off the EGR downpipe and connects to the exhaust pressure sensor just back of the fuel cooler. Anyway, once you got all that handled, you can tighten down all 10 and 13 millimeter bracket bolts. After that, get really, really mad about the dipstick as you re-secure it. Oh, I f hate you. I f hate you. Motherfucker. Everything has to be a f challenge. Every f step has to be a goddamn f challenge. Can't even put on the f dipstick without making it a f nightmare. F cock. Mother f f son of a f bitch. Mother f man. Come on. F go, you f you piece of shit. Mother f f goddamn mother f f son of a bitch. F hole. Where are you at? Yeah, after four days of this shit, I'm a little frustrated by the little things. I sure hope I don't have to work on this truck ever again. But anyway, once I had it out with the dipstick, we came to an understanding, and now we can continue installing the fuel cooler by connecting the turbo variable vane controller wiring harness. And speaking of wiring harnesses, make sure you go and secure all the wiring harness clips along the fuel cooler bracket we had to loosen up to remove it. Step 56, dig back into your turbo service kit bag and get the last overing gasket deals and install the fuel supply banjo bolts in the same manner we did the turbo oil supply banjo bolts. Torque these 17 millimeter banjo bolts to 35 foot pounds. The lower banjo bolt torque depends on if you have a copper or a steel washer with a Viton insert. For the copper washer like mine, it's 28 foot-pounds. For the steel version, it's 18 foot-pounds. Step 57, reconnect the cooling lines. Start with the shorty we moved from the turbo to the fuel cooler. If you'll recall, we just stored it there, so now we gotta put it back where it goes. Now find the longer coolant hoses we tucked away and reinstall them. Their length and shape will make it obvious where they go. Now we can install the hose clamps. How is the same 
Step 58, reinstall the degas bottle. I had totally removed the little metal clip before, so I'll just reinstall that now. Then I'll go grab the degas bottle and throw it in, connecting the vacuum line first and routing that all the way around before I insert it into the engine bay. The video is going to get terrible for a minute, but I'll reconnect the upper radiator hose next. Now I'll secure the degas bottle with the 13 millimeter bolts. Lastly, reconnect the overflow hose and the larger hose at the bottom of the degas bottle. Step 59, install the intake elbow and air filter box. If you'll recall, I need to replace the hose clamp that connects to the oil filler housing and then we can tighten down the two clamps and hold this contraption to the end. Now I'll grab the air box and toss that in with an 8mm socket and I'll reconnect the two electrical connectors. Step 61, install the batteries. For safety, I'll install both batteries and only the positive cables. So don't tell me you don't think... Step 62, remove the drain bucket and hose if you used one, then close the radiator drain petcock. Step 63, add coolant and water as needed to the system. You can refer to my Ford factory cooling system flush video I mentioned before. Step 64, get some motor oil. No, get some motor oil. No! Get you some motor oil, damn it! This thing needs gallons, not quarts. Since we stuck in a fresh oil filter, I'm gonna change the oil, and this thing takes 15 quarts! Leave it to Ford, though, to ask you for gallons of oil, but give you a quart-sized hole to fill it with. My word, man. Ford and everything they have ever done. Step 65, connect the negative battery cable. Step 66, Prime the fuel system. We can do this by turning the key to the run position for about 20 seconds so the fuel pump will run. I'm going to do this about 10 times just to make sure I bleed any air out of the system. Step 67, do a visual inspection to check for leaks or anything you might have forgotten to connect. It's best to use something really expensive like an iPhone for this task so if you drop it and break it, it'll fit right in with the theme of this truck. Step 68, cross your fingers for the moment of truth. In step 69, the sexiest and most important step, pat yourself on the back and make some kind of screaming movie reference to something only boomers will get. It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> hey, you made it to the end. Full disclosure, even though the repair worked, my old temps were never more than 12 degrees warmer than coolant temps while towing, and generally even while just driving around, the truck did blow up a couple months later with low compression and two cylinders. It happened at 185,000 miles, towing my fifth wheel up a mountain pass, so make of that what you will. But when it was happening, the oil temps were within spec and I didn't have any lights. I guess that's just what I get for putting months of work into a Ford to make it reliable, just to have it find some other way to f*** me. But other than all that, I hope you enjoyed my video. If you did, hit the like button, and if you want to see me tear out a motor with the cab on, and whatever happens next with this epic pile of a shit truck, smash the subscribe button. Hell, ring the bell icon so Google will know you have a serious case of schadenfreude because you want to see how I'm going to suffer next time. Yeah.